This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. A big-time hire at defensive coordinator and maybe... Maybe Sharon Moore starting to gather some early momentum. We'll discuss it here next on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Tim Clark. Brady gets terrific. Closer and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Closer at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. Five seven, 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming, sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue. I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. And boy, he needed that. We needed that. Because last week, if we had done an episode, my tenor and tone would have been a lot different than it's going to be this week. Getting blindsided by coaches leaving after they're telling players. We had multiple coaches leave after telling the players they were coming back. And then you turn right around and you go. And it very much looked like there wasn't a plan And I I don't necessarily expect Sharon Moore, rookie head coach, who had a job to do full time, uh, to to have this set up in advance. I do kind of expect the athletic director and the administration at Michigan to do it, though. Otherwise, whatever the hell, what the hell else are they doing there all day long? And it just seemed like we were getting blindsided by news all of the time. And you've got all these institutional advantages at a school like Michigan and you have to bring them to bear to help a 37-year-old rookie head coach who's drinking from a fire hose at this moment. And so now we've got multiple coaches telling the players they're, leave, they're staying, and then they turn around and they go. What, is, what in the H double hockey sticks is happening here? And on top of that, I mean, and hey, let's be honest. I wanted Mike Elston and Steve Klingscale to stay, but there's 130 teams in college football that offered neither one of those guys a defensive coordinator position as well, okay? So... I, I get that they were butthurt about being passed over, but everybody passed them over, not just Michigan. And I thank them for what they did for these outstanding last three years and wish them well in L.A. with the Chargers and enjoy wearing the prettiest uniform in American professional sports. But what, what Michigan needed desperately was to stop the, the bleeding here uh, and, and to put somebody in place in a pivotal coaching position that would calm fears and give everybody confidence, hey, we got a plan. We know what we're doing. Just take a deep breath, relax, and be patient. That hire's been made. Wink Martindale, new defensive coordinator. That is a tremendous hire. That's the best possible person that Michigan could have hired. Let me explain why here in this thread. We're dealing, number one, with a limited labor situation. We run a unique scheme. It's proprietary originally to just one NFL franchise that branched out to three NFL franchises this offseason, all of whom hiring new defensive coordinators, new defensive staffs this cycle. And hey, man, there's only so much labor in that situation to go around, and we're the last team on the totem pole. 
So to come out of this with Wink Martindale, one of the architects of the scheme we run, that's a remarkable success for Sharon. Wink's name is also known by players and recruits, which also should help us to retain the star players on what should be another top five defense in college football again this fall. So I understand Wink probably won't be much as a recruiter, but um, and he'll probably be a short-term hire. But that applies to his successful Ravens predecessors here too. Frankly, if the Philadelphia Eagles were smarter, we would have lost Jesse Minter last offseason. They they passed on him, and that was to their own chagrin. This does mean that Sharon is going to need to hire some go-getter recruiters as position coaches to con- compensate. Looks like we're bringing one of those in from Wisconsin as we speak. And we do need to also groom someone internally long-term in this scheme with the Ravens, well, running kind of dry. To me, Steve Klingscale would have been a good candidate for that, but he's now gone. So there needs to be somebody else identified when this defensive staff is filled out to be groomed internally to replace Wink. Now, Wink's approach with the Ravens defense is more aggressive than either of his two Ravens predecessor, but his scheme is nothing like what Don Brown ran. For example, what Mike McDonald and especially Jesse Minter did with it proves it's already way more adaptable than what Dr. Blitz used while he was here. It is true that the Giants led the NFL in blitz percentage the last two years with Wink as DC at 40%. That's roughly 13% higher than the NFL average those seasons, but that's actually lower than how often he blitzed with the Ravens, and that's when Mike McDonald and Jesse Minter were working for him, which again proves this scheme is very adaptable. McDonald didn't have to blitz with two first-round caliber edges. Aiden Hutchinson, number two pick in the draft. David Ojabo would have been a first pick, first-round pick, if not for the injury he suffered at Pro Day. Jesse Minter didn't have to blitz as often this year with the depth and explosiveness we had everywhere up front. But in the NFL, folks, you cannot just sit back and disguise coverages all game long against pros. You can, if you cannot pressure an NFL caliber quarterback, you're probably going to get lit up especially with the strict rules against impeding receivers on the back end. So um, when you look at the NFL this year, five of the top 10 blitz percentage defenses made the playoffs, including the Chiefs. Seven of the top 10 in quarterback pressure percentage also made the playoffs, proving again in the NFL, if you cannot pressure the quarterback, you're probably doomed. By the way, it, it kind of is funny to me how much everyone loves Jesse Minter now in hindsight, because when he was hired here, quite a few of the same people were concerned he was, quote, just a Vanderbilt guy. Now he's considered perhaps the greatest DC in school history. Who groomed him? Wink Martindale did. And again, given the tenuousness of our situation and the need for a young offensive coach to have an experienced defensive hand to oversee the other side of the ball while he wraps his arms around the program, this is the best we could have possibly done in February. Minimum B plus higher, minimum. So that provides a key cornerstone now With more to come, I'm feeling better than I was a week ago because a week ago I was was concerned. Let's find out if our Bucknut friend thinks I should still be concerned when we come back. Well, let's get an alternative viewpoint from our one and only Bucknut friend. Not our only one, just the only one we put on the air. Mark Rogers, the voice of college football. Check out his channel right here on YouTube as well. Great stuff, especially in the offseason. If you're gathering intel on things like win totals and things of that nature, he's got uh, correspondents all over the country covering teams all year round. Mark, good to have you back on the program, brother. How you doing? I'm doing well, Steve. Good to see you. How is everything? Better than I was a week ago. Um, a, a week ago, I was very concerned that... Somehow Michigan was completely unprepared for something that almost has happened the last two years in a row and had kind of hung its new coach uh, out to dry as a first-year coach. I'm I'm much more, I guess I'll say, well, first of all, we won the natty, bro. So, okay, I mean, I frankly don't care if we're seven and five next year, and I really don't, you know. And we might be, look at the schedule, I don't know. But, um, but you know, Eventually, that'll wear off, too, and I'd prefer to not have to make another coaching change in three years. I already did that, you know, the Rich Rod, Brady Hoke, every three-year shuffle. And so a week ago, I was very concerned that administratively, this university was not ready to do what needed to be done for Sharon Moore. Um, The events of the last week, I'm more confident, beginning with the hire of Wink Martindale. I think that is a big-time hire from a defensive coordinator standpoint. As I mentioned at the top of the show, 
we're in a labor glut right now. We run a very unique defense. It's proprietary to one NFL team. And, and now it's proprietary to three other NFL teams or to three NFL teams. And they all needed to hire new coaches this year. Well, in the future, I think this will help us because we have a bigger feeder system now. We, you know, now we've got three NFL teams in the future. Hey, yeah, here's our new uh, linebackers coach that will let you groom to be our DC for us for a year or two. But this year, putting together a defensive staff and competing against the Seahawks and um, the Ravens and the Chargers has not been easy. Not to mention, we had several guys that were pretty butt hurt that they weren't picked to be DC. Notice nobody else offered them DC jobs in college football too, by the way. All right. So to land the guy who's one of the architects of our system so we can keep it in place, a name that guys on our team that want to go into the NFL next year know. He's been one of the biggest name defensive coordinators in the NFL for the last several years. I'm feeling better than I was a week ago. I don't think we're out of the woods yet, but I think that was a major cornerstone there. What are your thoughts? Well, I think, Steve, we just start with the dynamic of losing a national championship coach. How often does that happen? So most teams are losing coaches because they're awful and they want to fire the coaches and and reload with with other coaches. And that's happening at the end of November, beginning of December. So Michigan, five to six weeks behind not everyone, but most teams that are looking for replacements, other than, of course, Alabama, Nick Saban. That's a unique situation. But this is the first time since Tom Osborne retired mm. after 1997 that a national championship winner has uh, lost its coach. And you have to go back to 1983, Howard Schnellenberger moving to the NFL, or he thought to the NFL, then to the USFL uh, in getting a, a new head coach for a national championship uh, team. So it's it's a rarity, and, and it's pushed into uh, deep into January at this point, and now into February by the time you start to interview and look for these guys. Uh, so it's a unique situation that Sharon Moore's had to deal with. And, uh, of course, he's been, and, and rightfully so, I get the point that uh, Jim has uh, – uh, listed him as the guy, uh, and everyone's comfortable with him, despite being a first-year head coach, that he has gotten all the thumbs up from everyone that counts uh, as being a guy that uh, should lead because of the culture being so good and such a key factor, apparently, in Michigan uh, winning a national championship and owning the Big Ten for three consecutive years that they wanted to hold that together. And then there's this Baltimore Ravens defensive philosophy mindset that they want to uh, keep uh, together as well. Uh, I think a lot of fans, they instantly run to, whether it's the college football or the NFL rankings, the statistics, you know, where did this guy's defense or offense rank? And therefore, we're going to evaluate him based on that. And it's almost impossible to find a guy that uh, had offenses or defenses ranked in the top five or ten at his particular level of the sport because those guys just keep their jobs or they elevate to head coaching positions. They're just not on the market. And just because they had a good fit and were a good fit for a particular situation doesn't mean that they're best for the job. Mm -hmm. So considering what this defense has accomplished with those people in place and that he is linked directly to – and the mentor of two of those uh, key members, uh, Jess Mentor being the latest, Mike McDonald, uh, also that, uh, yeah, it seems to, to be the move that, that should be made. And if college athletes don't know who he is, because I heard that out there, well, college athletes, uh, these guys don't know who Wink Martindale is. Well, then if they're not following the sport if they don't know who he is. And he simply can look, uh, turn his resume over and say NFL spot, NFL job, NFL job, NFL job. And that should get any uh, recruits attention. I do think, you know, I think we're pretty safe in the transfer portal window. We haven't had any major people uh, jump in there yet. And by the time Jimmy left, we were already well into the academic calendar. That was going to make it difficult anyway uh, from a, a transfer credit situation for guys. So I, I think the new staff uh, will get spring to make its case. And, and that was always going to be the case, right? I mean, the, the, even, even if more guys had stayed, meaning coaches, uh, more of the other, other assistants had stayed, 
uh, they were still, if, if people didn't like the direction in the spring, they were going to have options. So that's all you can ask for as a new coach these days is that you can retain as much of the roster as possible to try to make your case in spring football. So guys can decide before, you know, uh, whether to leave uh, before spring practice begins and then you can't replenish your roster. So I, that that could not have gone much better. And if and it, we get past spring and several big name guys jump in the portal, you and I will be having an oh oh conversation because that'll be a clear sign of how things went, right? Well, Steve, after what we witnessed three years ago with this program, and uh, of course Jim Harbaugh was was the head coach, so there's a, a caveat to that that he is that good and he's been around that long that you don't you you know that the ship is not sinking, but still. The number of changes to this coaching staff and the guys that were put into position as position coaches that had not coached those positions in the past going into 2021 Mm -hmm. that they that we both had questions about uh, and that that group got together that quickly just days before spring practice and pulled it together and then then eventually won the conference uh, makes me think that if you hire good people and this is my experience. It's less about specific background fit and skill set fit rather than people that are smart, that are hardworking, that have integrity, that have a character, at least as it pertains to their their work. And those are the people that you hire more so than an exact skill set that fits your operation. That's well said. And Steve Klingscale, who just left, is a testimony to that. He didn't come in until after spring. In 2021, I mean, he wasn't supposed to be on the staff. He was brought in after spring, and you know that ends up, you know, being uh, the defense that solves the Ohio State riddle, which is give up still 400 yards passing, but keep him out of the end zone, basically. Um, and I mean, uh, uh, something like 35 assistant coaches slash analysts Jim Harbaugh hired during his nine years at the University of Michigan. So I think that's the number, 35. So. Um, I, I'm feeling better than I was a week ago. A week ago, I was like, okay, clearly they don't have a plan. They didn't anticipate things. And, you know, you got to give a 37-year-old rookie coach, man, he, you've got all these institutional advantages at Michigan. Let's start leveraging some of those. Okay, we can't be getting blindsided every day by this guy's going to stay, tells the kids he's going to stay, then turns around and he leaves. Come on, man, that's clown show stuff. But but it does feel like, and you know, just before, you know, you and I went on the air, uh, it's been confirmed they're bringing in Wisconsin's defensive line coach who has a very impressive resume. Uh, I've looked at some of the names of, of guys they're looking at for secondary coach. Those are very impressive. So it seems as if we're kind of – it doesn't mean it's going to work out, but I'm feeling better than I was a week ago. Let, let's talk about a couple of other matters that have come up in college football while I have you here. A guy leaving as head coach of one Big Ten school to be the offensive coordinator at another – I guarantee you that's never happened. And, and I understand that resource-wise, UCLA is not what it used to be. But you and I are old enough to remember where, when they were the dominant program in L.A., when Terry Donahue had them as basically a perennial Rose Bowl top 10 program. Now, Bob Toledo, not too long ago, had some good teams in the early 2000s. For them to kind of be like, you know, I don't know, Indiana? Yeah. I'll just check out on UCLA and the number two television market in America and go be the OC at Ohio State. Is this just a unique circumstance in that, you know, there was all the talk Chip Kelly was getting fired last year and then turned around and beat USC. So is this really, he understands the posse's coming from him? Or is it, a, is it really a statement about where UCLA is as a brand right now? Because this is one of the more fascinating, I think, developments we have seen in recent college football history. Could you imagine Terry Donahue leaving his head coach at UCLA to be Earl Bruce's offensive coordinator at Ohio State, right? I mean, that just sounds nuts to say that, but that, that in a way, that's kind of what just happened. I think there are two strange dynamics here. One is Chip Kelly, one is UCLA. So with UCLA, they are not running a big, big time football program. They are trying to run it on the cheap. They're having financial issues that I would think are gonna be helped uh, readily here soon with the Big Ten TV and media contract. Mm -hmm. However, uh, they, they do have issues, not as a school, as an athletic department, 
financially. So, so that's one thing that I think possibly went into their decision late in the season because Chip Kelly was hanging by a thread. Many reported uh, they got blown out their final game by four scores against Cal. He keeps his job. He was giving indication that he wasn't fully invested in the job either. Not that I don't think he cares about winning and wants to do certain aspects of the job full throttle. He loves to coach. He loves to watch film. He loves to scheme. He loves to develop quarterbacks and work the offense. He hates to recruit. Now that it's NIL and it's transfer portal and all the resources that have to be and the time resource that has to be uh, put into that effort, uh, it's just not in him anymore. I think that's pretty obvious. He shopped himself to everybody possible. He went through the NFL circuit. Then he dropped it down to the high end on the uh, college route. And Ryan Day lucked into a hire here because he had just lost Bill O'Brien and the timing could not have been better for Ohio State. So Ryan Day, just when he was about to hand the the offense over to somebody that he could trust, uh, and, and it's and he's been reluctant to to uh, you know he has held on to that play sheet uh, with clinched fists that uh, to hand it over to somebody that he trusts uh, is tough to find. And now he's landed with another one. Obviously, the the guy that uh, was his head coach in college and who he coached under when he got his start. So he's going to trust Chip Kelly uh, as much as anyone. You know, since you bring that up, I, I listened to an interview Steve Spurrier gave when Jim Harbaugh hired Josh Gaddis and said, yeah, come on in here, reinvent our offense. And, I, and yeah, I've had offensive coordinators, but it's basically been my offense, my side of the ball. I'm giving you control. We're modernizing it, going speed and space. And, and Steve Spurrier said that he's always been against coaches, head coaches doing that. That if you're really good at doing that, which is what got you the job, why would you let someone who's not as good as you do that gig? Because that'll cost you your job. You know, and everybody always talks about, you know, there's so much going on game day. I don't know. I watched Sharon Moore coach the offensive line, coordinate the offense and head coach and win the biggest game of the year. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, I guess there's a lot going on game day, but whatever. Okay. And I've, I've thought a lot about the moves you guys are making, and I'm fascinated by it. Because, you know, the, the, the problem at Ohio State is not that Ryan Day doesn't know how to coordinate an offense. That's the branding of the entire program. And so now we're going to give that up, have that come from somebody from the outside. I saw Jim Harbaugh do that, and I saw that it didn't work out well for him. And what ended up working out was taking back control of that offense, reining Josh Gaddis in, then eventually letting him go and putting essentially uh, his little brother, Sharon Moore, who shares his brain – and having him coordinate it, you know, I mean, and running the ball 32 consecutive times in the second half against Penn State to win a game. I'm, I, I'm watching Ryan Day. Clearly, this is a one-year plan. The two quarterbacks that you guys have coming in in this class are more of your Ryan Day kind of recruit. So this year, go get, an, go get a, a, a game manager plus. Now, Will Howard's talent level is nowhere near J.J. McCarthy, but we didn't ask J.J. McCarthy to be anything other than a game manager plus, right? So go get a, a mobile veteran game manager plus quarterback. Pair him with a couple of dynamic running backs. I've seen that plan before, you know? And this kind of reminds me a little bit of how when Jim got frustrated that he couldn't beat Ohio State, tried to emulate Ohio State. Go get Josh Gaddis. We're going to do speed and space. We're going to put the Frisbee catching dogs out there and throw it all over the field. Go get this quarterback, Shea Patterson, you know, five-star recruit transfer, you know, and just let him chuck and duck. And it it didn't work for us. What worked for us was actually getting humiliated and Jim Harbaugh going back to basics of who he is. I am fascinated to see that Ryan Day is basically trying what we tried in reverse. He's essentially emulating our plan that has worked against him. Or is that too simplistic? Well, I, I think that he's been convinced or maybe he's been forced 
to be the CEO of this football program for as much as he would like to be CEO and play caller. He wants to call the plays. I don't think there's any question about that. It was presented to him at his news conference last week a number of different ways, and always when it was phrased, well, we're at a day and age in college football that it's impossible to be the head coach and to call the plays on game day, and then he would correct the reporter and say, well, it's 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 more difficult to do it that way, but it's not impossible. So he would like to still call the plays. So the next best thing for him is to be able to trust the guy, and I think he trusts Chip Kelly more than anyone, to be a guy that can be a quality control guy, can review their entire offense, can review every position, can give him honest evaluation of the way they ran the offense last year, what worked, what didn't work, to clean things up like I was. we were already hearing after only two or three weeks on the job, Bill O'Brien doing things like simplifying terminology and language and play calls and clean, just cleaning things up or just a different set of eyes from the outside at that same a cerebral level of a Ryan Day, not taking it away from him, but basically running what he does, but finding efficiencies and maybe some better things uh, and better ways to do it. And of course, Chip Kelly knows how to work an offense with a mobile quarterback. And that's what Ohio State will have for the first time in a few years. Final thing I want to ask you about, it was just announced right before you and I recorded this, that um, there's been an agreement, which surprised me. Um, ESPN has agreed to a contract extension with the college football playoff through 2031. So six more seasons valued at uh, $7.8 billion. Now, it's got to be approved by the conference commissioners and the wider college football playoff uh, apparatus. But, you know, given um, the uh, we essentially have uh, Fox and ESPN branded network conferences now acting as AFC and NFC, I thought for sure the Big Ten would insist that this go to open market to give uh, Fox a chance to uh, to bid. They didn't let it go to open market at all. Are you surprised by that? I am surprised because for the same reasons that you just stated, this was headed toward this direction. ESPN has had a lock on the playoffs since, what, around 2010, something in that range. And uh, yes, with the complete separation, it was one thing when – Uh, ESPN had a chunk of the Big Ten, but it no longer exists that way. And with the controversy of Florida State and all that's going on with Florida State uh, really pushing back, (laughs) that's that's a that's a mild way to put it in a just a flat out war against the ACC right now. Yeah, you, you just figured as though there was uh, going to be a determination made that this can only truly exist going forward if both of the superpowers had um, territorial rights in terms of media for this playoff, especially an expanded playoff. Uh, So so I am surprised by that. I haven't looked into it. I would love to hear uh, some type of insight into uh, anybody from Fox or anyone close or that is – knows anyone uh, from the Fox standpoint what uh, what may have happened there. I have a prediction, Mark, and, and, and this is on the heels of what was announced late last week, that Fox and ESPN are joining together to create an all-sports platform. I'm sure you saw this. We are heading towards nationalizing media rights for college football. That's what I think is, where this is. I think this is what the advisory committee that uh, Tony Petiti and Greg Sankey have formed – I, I, I think uh, Mordor and Isengard, or you can look at it the other way if you want, and you can say Rohan has called for aid, and so Rohan and Gondor are joining together, however you want to look at it, all right? But, but I think you are seeing now um, these two entities are not going fight, to fight it out the way Xerxes and Alexander the Great did. They're going to realize it's smarter when they're the two dominant players in the world just to split it in half, 50-50-50. I, I think we're heading towards, I, in fact, I'll even predict... This was this is the last Big Ten specific television contract that ever gets negotiated. I think we're looking at nationalized media rights, and that explains why they agreed to let ESPN keep it without a bidding process. They have formed a platform together, an all sports platform. I think that's where this is headed. Yeah, certainly the statement that came out last week gave a strong indication of what's important to them and what they see coming off the rails, and that they want to help this sport. Uh, avoid and their own interests avoid 
So they obviously had some preliminary talks to say, okay, we as the SEC, we see the future looking this way and how we can impact it. And then Big Ten saying, yeah, we pre- pretty much see it the same way in regards to what needs to be done, what needs to be challenged, what needs to be restructured. Okay, we are the two heavyweights in the sport. Obviously, the other two conferences were not mentioned in this in this statement. I think that speaks volumes, number mm-hmm. one. Number two, just the line of all the just issues, uh, legal and otherwise, in the sport and saying we want to have influence using, you know, very, very mild words, but that are that are going to uh, obviously be amplified at some point in regards to their weight uh, going forward. But uh, no, that's an interesting thought. I had not seen the ESPN news uh, so, so I have not taken that in or given that any thought. Uh, I did not see the TV news. And remember our new commissioner, what was he before he became our commissioner? He was a television was executive. TV. Yep, exactly. All right. Good stuff, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. You bet. We'll come back, wrap things up here in a moment. This week's Twitter poll results. We asked you what grade would you give Sharon Moore's hiring of Wink Martindale to be Michigan's next defensive coordinator? 44% of you said A. 37% of you said B, 19% of you said C. That brings us to our feedback of the week from Anti-Democratic, who says Sharon is a leader. I know how to spot them. Well, thank you. Whomever he hires to his staff, there's a reason behind each of them. I won't criticize a single move from him until I observe the entire 24 season, and I expect that I will be satisfied. I think it's a good move to see how this plays out on the field. We don't really know, unless as I was just talking about a few minutes ago with Mark Rogers, if we get out of spring and a bunch of guys who are big time contributors hop into the portal, that's not a good sign. Okay. That that's not a good sign, but in this day and age with unlimited player movement and everything else, uh, you had Mike Loxley at Maryland this week talking about a third string running back came into his office after the year demanding a hundred thousand dollars to stay. Okay. Uh, Given the era we're in, all you can ask for now when you're a new coach is to let your team, your team's core best players returning, give you spring practice to prove yourself. That's all you can ask for. And and we're going to get that, it looks like. And then if we made the wrong hires, or if Sharon made the wrong hires, and if we end up seeing key players in the transfer portal as a result, that'll be a, uh-oh. But I'm optimistic we won't see as much of that as our rivals would like to believe. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, share, follow, five-star review, whether you're watching here on YouTube or listening on iTunes. We'd love it if you did those things. It helps us via the algorithms to find more Michigan fans just like you. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, in between or X, in between episodes, at Michigan Podcast. There again, at Michigan Podcast there. Until the next time, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue. Go Blue.